Welcome to the Palace of Westminster, or at least seen from one of the few angles where you can't see that much scaffolding. I'm here today to talk about exactly what's going on with all of the scaffolding we see covering the sides of the Palace of Westminster, blighting, some would say, Parliament. What's going on with all of that construction, maintenance and restoration work? I caught up with the constitutional expert and member of the House of Lords, Lord Norton, to tell us exactly what the restoration and renewal project is all about. Lord Norton, it seems like we've been talking about the grand restoration and renewal project of the British Parliament for years now. And it seems like there have been so many discussions, debates and votes, and yet nothing has really been agreed. It seemed at one stage people wanted to leave Parliament to repair it. Now it looks like an iterative process. The whole place is constantly clad in scaffolding. What on earth is going on? Why haven't any decisions been made? Well, you're quite right. And it's not that it's not progressed. In fact, it's regressed in terms of the decisions that have been taken. If anything, we're going backwards on earlier decisions. We did pass an Act of Parliament to try and address it. Now the intention is to move away uh, from that. And I think it, it's a clash between recognising the need to do something to deal with a palace it is in a state of decay against members who are reluctant to move out. Does that say, oh, well, yes, something must be done, but not now, because it's extraordinarily expensive to keep the palace as it is maintained, never mind the cost of having to restore and renew the place. So this is the interesting distinction. I know that maintenance as it stands sometimes runs over a hundred million pounds a year yeah. just to keep things standing still, or according to one recent report, actually to keep things sliding backwards, but at a slower pace than they might otherwise be. Um, why on earth have we got this gridlock over making a decision? money, it's thought, well, it'd be politically unacceptable to spend 17, 20 billion pound on uh, renewing it. Although if they try and stay in, the cost becomes even more uh, exorbitant. Let's take a step back and just, I think there's a wide understanding that the Palace of Westminster is quite old, is uh, failing in places, not just in those who we elect, yeah. but also in the structure of it itself. Oh, it's absolutely. crumbling to yes. bits. Just how bad has it got? It's got very bad because it was built in the mid 19th century and um, nothing really substantial done since the Second World War. It's been um, patching things up as we've gone along, which is now just the problem because so many has been so much has been done on an incremental basis. There are wires all over the place. There are actually flues which are so concentrated with wires in them that people thought you can't get into them because they're just chock a block and nobody's sure where all the wires go. Um, so it, it, it's the, the, the challenge is uh, enormous and it is uh, in a state of complete uh, disrepair. And there is the prospect of catastrophic failure. The water system might give up or some other infrastructure making the, the place uninhabitable anyway. And we're just having to try and tread water to keep the place going, but in a way that it's actually difficult to keep on top of. Currently, as I understand it, there are individuals who are hired to walk around the building 24 seven, just looking out for fire. Yes. How have we got to that stage? Well, we are, uh, the, 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 the estate is a uh, great fire, it's the palace. Um, as you say, we've got fire watchers. They're there 24 hours a day going round, making sure that the places that there isn't a fire, um, which are absolutely catastrophic. So the sort of maintenance minor costs each year, is about 15 million pound cost of public purse. But then there are the major projects as well, which this year, next year, the year after, run at roughly about 100 million. So over the next four or five years, the cost of the public purse of just keeping it going is going to be about four or five hundred million pounds. There are a number of parliaments around the world that have suffered this same dilemma, most notably and probably most comparably Canada, where they have decided to decant. For yeah. 10 years, multiple parliamentary terms, they are sitting in a pretend House of Commons, one that's built in a separate building temporarily, and yeah. they conduct their business in that. Is that what we're facing? Potentially over a decade of MPs not being in the same chamber that Winston Churchill stood in, that Clement Attlee stood in, that Margaret Thatcher stood in, uh, potentially losing that sense of history for over a decade? 
Well, that would be the best case scenario, just uh, 10 years or more moving out, because if we try and stay in and work around it, um, it wouldn't have the same characteristics, the same features we associate with Parliament. I say that could take up to 70 years or more. 70 years? Well, 76, I think, was the latest estimate uh, at, at enormous public expense. So the, the least costly option uh, and the one that would take least time is that of both houses decanting for 10, 15 years, possibly a bit longer, um, so that it can be uh, undertaken. And I suppose the terrible irony here is that this is a palace that was constructed in response to a big catastrophic event. The old palace of Westminster, the Church of St Stephen's and the rest of it burning down in 1834 as a response to a tally stick fire beneath the House of Lords. That's the real danger that there's a repeat because we are, uh, there's a major fire risk, it could burn down. And the difference is that this time we're dealing with uh, a site that's a World Heritage Site, uh, Grade 1 listed, it's so iconic that we want to preserve it, so to lose it would be a complete, not just national disaster, but obviously international, global, uh, in terms of its impact, so we need to preserve it. But the longer we prevaricate and can't make up our mind as to what to do about it, of course, the greater the danger of that happening. So the danger is the decision will be taken out of our hands because there will be some catastrophic failure. So why is there all this netting around Victoria Tower? That one is simply to catch any masonry that may fall. So it's actually a protective uh, device, nothing to do with actually making any significant changes. Um, it's purely because there have been problems with falling masonry throughout the palace. And I gather the Victoria Tower is a, a problem and there is the prospect of um, some parts of it falling. Until there is an enormous restoration project on the tower itself, a sort of cocoon perhaps, like there was with Elizabeth Tower at yes. the other end. Yes. This will just stay there in perpetuity until something gets done. Well, unless they're practicing to do anything else with it, but again, it would be temporary mm. rather than part of the R&R programme. So there's lots of temporary measures just to protect places. Others, there will be some work done to uh, patch it up, but essentially that's what it is around the palace. It's just patching up until such time as we actually get round to uh, undertaking R&R. &R. So I suppose until restoration and renewal starts properly, Parliament will continue to have big, ugly sheets of scaffolding engulfing it, waxing and waning at points, but sort of always there. Absolutely. It will be um, a continuous process. Some part of the palace will just be engulfed in scaffolding of this sort which is both extensive, aesthetically unappealing and sends out a rather bad signal about Parliament, how people view the actual institution of Parliament. It's not drawing them in of wanting to come and see how Parliament operates. Now, I suppose some people would say that the restoration and renewal project in and of itself will make Parliament look ugly for an expanse of time. There will be that and the, the appeal will simply have to come and look at the two chambers operating separately from uh, the palace, but it's the price one has to pay because one has to tackle the problem and the problem is an unwillingness to bite the bullet. Elizabeth Tower, as it was renamed in 2012, has recently become uncocooned. It was stuck in uh, scaffolding for the best part of half a decade and it looks magnificent now. It has been restored, but but this is separate from restoration and yes. renewal. I mean, they've done a grand job and this now looks as people expect it to look. So it's a great draw. But actually within the palace, you've still got all the problems, which is why we need restoration and renewal. So internally, it's in a state of great decay and potential problems, which could be absolutely horrendous unless they're addressed fairly quickly. So this facade is completely misleading in terms of the challenge faced by the building as a working environment and one that's actually safe. In the early 70s, if you looked at the palace, it's in a dreadful state because of uh, the effect of um, all the pollution. The exterior looked you know, basically black, so they had to sandblast it. This can be very misleading because the way that this has been done 
the restoration of Elizabeth Tower. It now looks absolutely magnificent, but this is distinct. This is separate from restoration and renewal. Yes, I mean, this is just part of maintaining it. What had to be done in any uh, event internal to the palace is the fact that uh, the infrastructure is in danger of collapsing, basically.